Well, thanks everyone for joining us today for our latest HydroTerra webinar. Today we're joined by Dr. Paul Fakema from the Bureau of Meteorology, and it's um, a bit of a reunion for me. I've known Paul for many years, so thanks for coming along today, Paul. Really appreciate it. Sure. The topic is monitoring and forecasting catchment hydrology. And uh, before we charge into that, a few housekeeping matters, and I'll give you a bit of the background of Paul. As I mentioned, we're the two presenters. So I'm the Managing Director of HydroTerra, and Paul is Team Leader of Water Forecasting at the Bureau of Meteorology. We love your questions, and thanks to those people who've sent through some early bird questions already. Um, we will look forward to answering those questions at the end of this presentation. In terms of raising other questions, you just use your Q&A button on, uh, on the top of your screen, I think it is, and uh, type away in there and I will read those questions out to Paul at the end and he'll do his best to answer them. Why does HydroTerra undertake these webinars? Well, they're proving very popular and it's great to see so many people coming along today, but we really are passionate about sharing knowledge and today's a really good example of not just sharing our own knowledge, but sharing the knowledge of others as well. Um, we do believe in facilitating education. We feel that in the industry at the moment, there's probably a bit of a lack of um, really good relevant hands-on training happening. So we're doing our best to provide some of that through this forum. And we're also trying to show a bit of a industry leadership position, bringing up topics which seem timely. And this one around catchment hydrology, I don't think there's been a, a bigger phase in Australia's history where catchment hydrology hasn't been more important, whether it's related to floods or to resilience in agriculture. Okay, so a little bit about Paul. Um, I first met Paul when we were both doing our masters at Melbourne University, uh, studying hydrogeology. And uh, we both then also got some funding to join what was then the Cooperative Research Centre for Catchment Hydrology. Uh, Paul's taken his passion for all things hydrology and forests uh, on a, a really long and stellar career. Um, once he finished his PhD, which was also done with the, the CRC uh, and was related to forest hydrology, he then went on and worked for DELP in Victoria on plantation research and then went to Melbourne University as a forest hydrology research fellow. Um, since then, he has moved into the Bureau of Meteorology and currently is team leader responsible for all things water forecasting. So I feel very lucky to have Paul here today. In terms of the things that Paul's going to talk about today, he's gonna to talk about the services around seven day stream flow forecasts, seasonal stream flow forecasts and new landscape water forecasts. Um, the reason we decided to put this webinar on today is we've been involved with uh, monitoring of catchment projects recently. And as part of one of those monitoring projects, we really have had the opportunity with some funding from DPI in New South Wales to investigate what all those resources are out there that can be used as monitoring uh, information around those catchments. And I was really impressed with what's available in this sort of spatial uh, context around forecasts. And uh, you're yeah, truly blown away with things like uh, forecasts of planned available water and that sort of thing. So I felt enlightened and I thought Paul uh, would be a good guy to inform us all a bit more broadly. So with Without further ado, Paul, over to you. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Richard. And, and look, thanks for having me um, along. It's good to rekindle um, old relationships. So, um, and always, you know, enjoy talking about uh, the Bureau's 
uh, water forecasting capability. So um, when we go, we'll go to the 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 next slide. So yeah, just uh, for people, um, <clears throat> uh, just to let you know. So I, I'll look after a team that's responsible for water forecasting, uh, delivering the water forecasting services in the in the the bureau. Um, been there for nine years, undergone some transformations recently, but at the moment we look after um, seven day stream flow forecast and a seasonal stream flow forecast. Also a very new uh, landscape forecast um, that were released um, later last year. Um, and so we'll talk about those uh, as well. So next slide, thanks Richard. So that's really the, the, the topic for today. So those are the, 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 I guess the services I'll talk about, um, but before we do that, I'll, I'll uh, cover just an introduction to, to place this into some context. Next, thanks Richard. So the, the Bureau, it covers in terms of its water information and water forecasting services it covers um, um, uh, across a lot of uh, temporal and spatial scales um, just click again thanks Richard and uh, we'll be covering sort of in that this that well, that in that that red sort of circle there in terms of looking at the from seven days out to um, three month uh, forecasts and we'll be looking at both catchment and continental scale uh, forecasts as well. Thanks, Richard. So I guess in terms of our, our forecasts, you know, when we started, the water information program started in the Bureau about 10 or 11 years ago now. Um, um, the Bureau did, did provide flood forecasts, but we didn't uh, provide any other water information or water forecasting um, information back then. Um, and it was during the drought <clears throat> that um, uh, the Bureau uh, became, I guess, a central point in, in organising the, the country's um, water information um, and, and providing new services. And, and some of those new services included providing water forecasts. So one of the first things um, I guess we did was understand uh, the, the potential uses or, or applications of these water forecasts. So um, um, over that time, we've, we've developed relationships with a number of different managers in different areas. Um, and users. So our forecasts are generally used for, for managing storages, um, uh, for uh, helping um, uh, regulate environmental flows, um, for river managers, uh, they certainly find it useful um, both in seven day and seasonal um, areas, uh, for farmers um, uh, and to develop their, their management and cropping strategies as well. Um, there are recreational users as well that use the forecasts, uh, whether it's boating or fishing uh, or camping along rivers. Um, and we, and particularly in the seven day area, um, those forecasts provide um, important information to support fl flood forecasting as well. And we're also working on a project to actually integrate our seven day um, and our flood forecasting services um, uh, more deeply. Thanks, Richard. So I guess, you know, one of the things just to give you an idea is a bit of context as to uh, what goes into making um, a good forecast. Uh, we need user needs. So like I just said before, one of the, you know, the first thing we do is understand who, why we're, why we're developing these services and who might be using them. So data sharing is a really important one. So gathering the data, particularly updating our models um, and being able to update those forecasts regularly is really important. Um, so that's where you will, I guess, come in in terms of monitoring in particular, um, having access to, to, um, to good data and having access to it quickly is really important and those systems that facilitate that. The science and systems comes into it as well. So we work very closely with um, CSIRO, Melbourne Uni, for example, um, develop systems to uh, allow that data share, sharing and forecast generation to happen quickly. And then um, we don't assume that, that the forecast will be used straight away. So we need to, um, we need to work with, with potential users as well to understand, for that, to help them understand how the forecast may be useful for them. And that it's a continuous, um, a loop, I guess. Thanks, Richard. So <clears throat> moving now on to the seven day forecast. These are catchment based forecasts. As I mentioned, we, we operate at, at different, um, uh, different um, spatial scales. Next, thanks, Richard. Um, and uh, so the Bureau has undergone a, a process where we'll, we'll, we will continue to provide catchment scale forecasts for seven day and seasonal um, forecast, but we also at the continental scale provide a gridded uh, forecast as well. That being that at the catchment scale, we generally have finer resolution and better performance. So particularly in the cases of flood, 
forecasting and seven day forecasting, we really need that catchment based. Um, those catchment based forecasts for that better performance um, within those catchments of interest where they're going to have the biggest impact. So the seven day forecast service started um, uh, about 2015, uh, upgraded in 2017 or 18 um, to provide ensemble forecasts. That's another big area that the the, um, the Bureau has been investing in rather than providing deterministic or a single forecast out for seven days, we provide an ensemble. Mm -hmm. So to give a, give users an indication of um, the uncertainty and the likelihood of certain um, le river levels and river volumes being reached. So we, we, we can't provide um, a service um, uh, for uh, over 200 locations across the country, they, they are grouped in a in hundred or so catchments. So we have a number of, we generally have a number of uh, forecast sites within a, a given catchment. The forecasts are updated um, every morning and they go out for seven days. So um, on the, the left hand panel provides a, an indication of uh, what, the, what the, the website looks like. I've, for each of their services, I've provided a, um, a link um, so um, you're certainly more than welcome to, to access that link. Um, and there's lots of other inf background information as well. Next, thanks, Richard. So <clears throat> these are the, the main products, I guess, that, that you'll come across on the website. Um, the top two showing um, daily uh, and hourly forecasts. So within each of those panels, um, you've got um, on the left side of each of those panels in the blue, there's the observations and then to the right in red are the forecasts. Um, on the lower parts of those um, upper charts, you've got the, the river uh, or the, the stream flow volume forecasts for information. And on the top, you've got rainfall. So you've got, um, uh, I guess, both um, observed and forecast rainfall and stream flow in those plots. Um, and again, it gives you an idea of what the plumes and uncertainty um, what those uncertainties are around those estimates as well. Um, at the bottom, uh, the accumulated uh, rainfall and stream flow forecast give you an idea of accumulations uh, for the next seven days and the uncertainty around those. Um, and then on the right, um, we've got information that, that, that provides you information on um, how good these forecasts are. One of the things the Bureau um, is pretty strong on um, is verification um, and testing of, of performance of these forecasts. So um, uh, it gives you, and, and we, we generally um, benchmark that against climatology. So what would you, um, if by chance uh, um, you were to estimate, you know, uh, what the flow might be in the next seven days, how well do our forecasts do compared to what you could otherwise do by just looking at long-term averages? So green, green boxes there show where the forecasts are better. Uh, than climatology and, and, and purple um, show where they're not as good as climatology. So um, we generally, for, for this particular forecast, you'll see that the, the forecast um, is better than the climatology for the next four days or so. Thanks, Richard. Um, I should mention also that each of these products also has a description and, and information um, on, on how they're derived, on the information that sits behind them, and you can also download the, the data that sits behind any one of those images as well. So just to give you an idea of how we go about um, um, cal or how we, how we develop these forecasts or generate them and, and the data that goes in, the top left shows um, uh, the inputs. So largely past information is a really important, um, hence the, the, the monitoring and the data systems that allow us to ingest that data very quickly is important. So rainfall, uh, so daily rainfall for the previous few days, um, as well as past daily stream flow are really important um, inputs, as well as the, um, uh, the seven days ahead uh, hourly or three hourly rainfall um, forecasts as well from our systems. So um, they go in to um, a rainfall runoff model that runs on an hourly time step. Um, there's some post-processing that occurs and that's where the, the daily stream flow comes in. Um, and that is then used to, to generate uh, the seven day ahead uh, forecast. Thanks, Richard. Um, one of, again, talking about um, uh, the, you know, how we increase adoption, I guess, and how, we, how we've worked with um, users in the past. Um, one, of the, one of the ways we've done that is develop a number of case studies 
Um, this one's available on the website as, as well, um, where we work with the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority um, and we helped uh, them with a decision that was made or that would have been made to release water from Lake Eildon. So one of the challenges they have in, in relation to environmental flows or the Gold Murray Water has in relation to environmental flows releasing water from Lake Eildon is, is meeting certain targets, but, but then avoiding um, unwanted flooding further down um, uh, in, in the lower part of the, the Broken Goulburn catchment. Uh, so uh, now we don't provide, so what, one of the things that we, we provide is um, seven day forecasts below Lake Eildon, so the tribs that, that flow into the Goulburn. And so that provided them with guidance um, uh, as to whether they should or shouldn't release water from Lake Eildon. Um, and this was suggesting that um, increased flows were likely um, in the tribs uh, below Lake Eildon, and so they actually made the decision not to release water, which could have potentially uh, led to unwanted flooding further downstream. So that was one, um, uh, I guess, a case study that, that was shown. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so moving on, uh, next. Um, also talking about um, so the, the seasonal streamflow forecast service, which is probably one of the oldest or the earliest um, services that, that, that was developed by the Bureau as part of the Water Information Program back in 2010, I think they, they initially released them to registered users. Um, and so we've probably had most experience with this particular service in working with um, customers. So this one is one where we provide uh, cumulative forecasts of streamflow volumes out to three months ahead. We do that um, at over 200 forecast locations, or that's actually over 340 for registered users as well. Um, and we tend to put sites into registered users before we then transfer them across to uh, the public. Anyone um, can access those registered user sites you just need to let me know. Um, and we can send you the details. Uh, so that, that, that's a free service as well. Again, the link is at the bottom left there. Um, and the main product, uh, the first product that people, that, that users are, um, visitors are, are shown is, is the box plot to the lower right. Um, again, to the left showing the observed and to the right in, in red showing the forecast. Um, here we've got, uh, the, so the red forecasts are overlaid onto the blue um, historical reference. So that is the, the long-term historical reference, what you would expect for this time of year at this location. And then the red um, uh, forecasts are overlaid onto that. So it gives you an idea of what you are likely to expect or what is more likely to happen at this site for the next three months, whether median flows or are likely to be higher or lower or near median. Um, and again, you'll see there are box plots. So here we've got, I mean, in this case, we've got 5,000 um, ensemble members that go into these um, these distributions here. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of, uh, of the spread, I guess, and the variability that we see. And again, you can navigate through a, a dynamic map on the top there and, and move your way around the country. Next. Thanks, Richard. So here we've got um, at the top left was the, the product I, I showed before. We have two other products to, um, I guess, communicate what the forecast is suggesting in the top right is um, uh, flow categories so where we um, we split up the historical flow um, at a particular location at a particular over a time period um, into low near median or high flows so into equal thirds um, and then we represent what the uh, forecast this tells you this particular forecast is suggesting that there's a higher chance of, of, of having near median or high flows um, for the Hume Dam for this particular, for those three periods. And, and yeah, we can see that you've got a one, one, two and one, two, three month cumulative, um, uh, cumulative flow flows uh, for that particular site. Um, the lower one, probability of exceedance curves um, as well, just a different way of representing the same, um, the same information. Um, thanks, Richard. Um, as I mentioned, the we're pretty um, uh, uh, fussy in relation to verification. So um, providing information on how well the forecasts um, um, perform um, is really important. So we do hindcasts um, where we have a cross validation procedure um, where we look over, over the past generally 20, 30 years 
um, and we test to see how the forecast would have gone had we applied them um, for each of those time periods across that across those 20 or 30 years. So the top left is a is a skill score metric that is commonly used. Um, and so this this again, it's a box plot. We've, we've got a rather than a single figure, we've developed a what's called a bootstrapping method to get a, a distribution of skill or performance. So um, it uh, has a median and a, a distribution around that median. Um, again, we provide skill or performance measures relative to the historical reference. So um, many water managers in the past would have used um, spreadsheets um, and looked at the historical average over a certain period, and that would have guided them in relation to what they might expect for the coming months. So um, we provide our, we sort of benchmark our forecast in relation to what what you could expect by using the long term average. So um, so these box plots, if they're above the blue line, they are better than um, using the historical reference. And um, I guess the the, you know, the amount, uh, the distance above the line gives you a better feel for how well. Um, so what I guess those box plots are telling you is that certainly for those, except for May to, to July, um, you've got a hundred percent chance that our forecast will do, will be better than using the long-term average as a guide. Um, and in some cases, forecasts aren't as good. You'll see that the, the forecast, this is a particularly good um, site um, inflows into the Hume Dam. Many sites in many parts of the country don't have as good a skill as using historical reference. So that's a guide really that um, you shouldn't place too much emphasis on those on those forecasts. Um, and so that's, a, that's an important guide to use as, as to know when or what sort of, um, I guess, assurance or confidence they place um, in the forecast. Um, and, and you'll see also that um, the forecast, and this is something we see quite often, Perform um, so particularly in those transition in the in the southeast mainland anyway, when we transition from dry to wet, it's generally a challenge. Um, and one of the reasons, um, as I'll talk about um, in the next slide, I think it is, is that one of the inputs we have um, is the previous month's stream flow. So persistence in, in flows is a really important part of our performance. Um, and the, so the, the on the right, just a different um, the un, uh, the. I guess giving users an idea of where our forecasts um, fell in terms of, or where the observations fell um, in terms of our forecasts related, being able to relate our forecast to the observed flows that occurred during that time in the past. Um, and in the bottom, um, again, this is something that users were keen to have more information on. Um, and it really was about, hey, look, how well have our forecasts gone over the past year? for those three month periods um, and the red shows the the forecast themselves so you'll see that certainly during July September for this particular uh, back in 2019 uh, um, uh, this was that our forecasts um, were um, tended to overestimate the flows that were reserved during that winter period thanks Richard so climate influences uh, top left um, so the Ensign IID are, are, are main ones, but um, there are others as well. And then on the right, just give you an idea of um, the, the antecedent catchment conditions. So really what we're talking about is stream flow from the previous months. So they're the two bits of, the main bits of information. Um, and this was a, a system that was an approach developed known as BJP, um, the Bayesian Joint Probability a Model developed by colleagues at CSIRO. Um, and that allows us to generate 5,000 um, uh, ensemble members, the distribution, and there we then provide that distribution out to one, two, and three months ahead. Thanks, Richard. Don't tell me it's happened again. No, good. Um, so we, and that allows us to provide a, um, a national overview. So uh, one of those forecast products I mentioned, those bar charts in terms of flow categories. Um, if we take the most dominant um, flow category from each location, and this is the, this is the current forecast that we, we're about to release uh, on Monday, I think. Um, um, and so this is the overview, uh, and this provides, um, I guess, a national overview um, of where we expect flows to be 
either high, near, median or low. And we also have an, a normal flow category. Um, that one is one we developed only a few years ago um, it, to, to deal with the situation. This is one of the challenges we have with the national system that uh, these models um, work well um, in some areas and, and maybe less well in others. Um, so one of the challenges we have um, in particular with um, arid and northern areas, um, a, a, a no flows or, or zero flow days, um, you know, how do you forecast that? Um, and so we made a decision that where flow volumes are, are, are very low, and we, we, we had a certain threshold that we specified um, across the catchment, then we would, um, um, it, well, it makes no sense to try and forecast a flow when it's likely to be zero. So, um, so for those, we, we, um, we provide a category called normal flow where um, really you just look at the long-term average as your guide to what you would expect. Um, at those locations. So typically at this time of year, not surprisingly, a lot of the um, normal flows are, are expected in the in the northern part of the country. Um, but yeah, it gives you an idea of where flows are high and where they're not. Um, our flood forecasts sometimes use this information as well, um, particularly at the moment um, in the southeast, not surprisingly, um, lots of high flows um, and that um, is something, I guess, along with wet catchments that our flood forecasters look at together with the, the forecast rainfall as to what the, the next season uh, might hold ahead. Next one. Thanks, Richard. Um, and again, so the skill scores we do in the same way. We, we categorise those skill scores um, uh, according to certain, in certain categories so that we can communicate how well um, the, the forecasts are expected to perform across the country. And you do see um, you know, variations throughout the year. As I said, during the autumn period, particularly, I think April is typically the month where performance of our forecast is the lowest overall. Um, and so you gen generally see a seasonal trend in the, uh, in the skill scores across the country uh, as well. Thanks, Richard. So this is... Um, um, uh, a just another example of how these forecasts have been used at case study, which isn't on our website, not one of the published ones. There are a number of other ones as well. Um, but this is a, a case study where we worked with um, uh, DPIE in um, uh, in New South Wales. I think they're DPE now. They've undergone an another name change, where they were using our forecasts uh, inflows into Angela uh, Dam. And together with some estimates of, of their own estimates of um, evapotranspiration demand in particular, um, so extractions, they put together um, um, a different scenarios as to water storage levels for Angular for the next well, six months. Um, um, and they provide that in their, their, um, their allocation statements that they issue uh, to their customers um, during the irrigation season. And so we work together to provide a, I guess, a pilot study or just a, a test to see whether um, the Bureau's forecast could be used to provide a little bit more certainty around those. So they've got these um, dry, median and wet and minimum um, scenarios that they apply, um, but they used our inflow forecast along with their demand forecast to, um, to develop that green wedge there, which is based on, on the Bureau's inflow forecast. And you'll see that um, it's a narrower spread than their own uh, um, forecast. Next, thanks, Richard. You can probably do a couple of clicks because there's a couple of animations. So thank you. So if you look at the inflow climatology based on their own um, climatology, so they would have used long-term inflows to guide these scenarios. Um, and, and here they've used a 20th to 80th percentile inflow climatology. You get that spread. Using our inflow climatology, you get the spread um, shown by the green wedge. Um, and so I guess that's the moral of, of the story in a lot of our forecasts is that our forecasts tend to reduce the uncertainty that you would normally expect um, at these locations. So to give users a better, um, yeah, more certainty, I guess, in terms of, of what flows they may expect. Next, thanks, Richard. I think there's one more popping up. So that was the, the I guess, the level that, that ended up being the actual level. Thanks, next one. So now we'll move on to um, a rel the relatively new service that the Bureau has provided based on hydrological forecasts on a, on a, on a gridded scale across the country. Uh, thanks, Richard. So 
Um, the service is known as the Strain Water Outlook, um, and I've shown the, the, the link up there. Um, it was released in uh, to, uh, last year, uh, and really we're, we're moving towards a, a more seamless um, water balance service. So the Bureau has provided um, historical gridded information for a number of years now um, via what was um, via the same model um, called Aura, Australian Water Resource Assessment uh, hyphen L for landscape model, also developed um, in partnership with CSIRO um, over a number of years. Um, and so the, there's been a number of, so that historical information um, has been there now for a number of years where we provide um, output for um, um, things like soil moisture and ET and um, runoff um, for the, like, I think it's from 1900 or 1911 up until yesterday. So it's updated every day. Um, and you can extract the data that all that history. As you can imagine, there's a lot of um, technology and, and systems uh, that underpin it um, uh, as well, because these calculations obviously are not, are not trivial um, at all. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, gives you an idea of um, the, the type, the information that goes in and comes out of this model. So it's a, it's a water balance model. Um, uh, it's known as Aura L. You may have heard of it. Uh, as I mentioned, the Australian Water Resource Assessment Landscape Model. Um, across the whole country, it's updated on a daily time step. This is this is for the historical information. I should say the monthly. Sorry, the the seasonal forecasts are updated every month. Um, and although that might change in future, it's still, as I said, it's a new service and we're, and we're developing um, as we go uh, still. So there'll be improvements into the future and it operates at a 5K resolution across the country. So the inputs, um, uh, the, the, the variable inputs, I guess, are rainfall temperature and, and solar radiation. There are a number of fixed inputs across the country that relate to uh, the maximum relative um, available water capacity within the soil, um, saturated conductivity, uh, uh, leaf area index, these are all fixed um, parameters uh, across the country. So um, for the historical service, every day the model is run, it's run on a daily time step um, and provides um, output, as you see on the right, um, for soil moisture, um, evapotranspiration and uh, runoff in particular, uh, they're the ones that are of main interest. Uh, and so what I should, yeah, so the, the, I think the one that's of most interest um, is the soil moisture. That's certainly from customers that we've heard, particularly um, landholders calculated as uh, the excess leaving um, a group Deep drainage. Um, so that's just something to, to bear in mind. Some of the definitions of these parameter or these processes um, may be a bit different to what people um, have um, or, or perceive them to be. So these the cells are not connected, so that the, the water is not routed through the landscape. So that's just something to be aware of. But that's something um, we're likely to address uh, into the future as well. Thanks, Richard. So um, gives you an idea of how the the system works to a degree. Um, uh, so we're providing three month forecasts um, for individual months. Uh, in this case, we have a, a 99 member ensemble. So again, we, we've stuck with um, where we really are moving towards ensemble based forecasts. So um, we've, we've got a 99, obviously it becomes difficult running the model many times with such a complex uh, model. Um, so there are 99 mem uh, ensemble members that go into the, the maps that we find, that we then produce. Um, and in terms of the forecast, there are three output variables, one being the root zone soil moisture. So that's from zero to one meter soil moisture um, and uh, actual evapotranspiration and also runoff, as I mentioned before. So um, the inputs um, in blue, their access S being the, the, bu the, the Bureau's current um, seasonal uh, uh, or numerical weather prediction. So that's what is used to provide the climate outlooks for uh, rainfall and temperature um, for the Bureau. So we, we get um, uh, rainfall temperature and solar information from that 
system or that, that model. Um, and we also use wind uh, the climatology as well, primarily to, to calculate um, the vapor transpiration. Uh, that goes into the um, model itself. There is some um, uh, satellite information um, particular that goes into simulate data and that's related to soil moisture as well to improve the accuracy of that soil moisture. Um, and then, then there's an up, update that occurs to provide those three month um, outlooks. We do generate, we can generate these um, forecasts every day uh, as we update the model, but we only issue them um, once a month on the, on the first of the month at the moment. Um, again, that might change. Um, our climate um, outlooks are now updated or well, we provide a, a you know two three weekly um, uh, climate outlook that's updated every two weeks so it, it may well be in future that um, these forecasts are updated more regularly um, and not just once a month thanks Richard gives you an idea of what um, what a typical map might look like so um, a monthly time step um, we We've chosen the um, median of the percentiles. Again, it's, a, it's an ensemble, so we have to choose a, a particular variable to focus on. Um, and then we, we provide, as we do with our other climate outputs, is we, um, we provide an indication of, of where that variable is likely to sit based on what you would normally expect for, this, for a particular location at that time of year. So would you expect you know, soil moisture in this case to be average or higher than average or lower than average. But we do also provide um, estimates of actual um, soil moisture numbers. So um, in terms of the plant available water, for example, um, how full do you expect the bucket to be um, at this time of year as well? So there are two, two main outputs, I guess. Uh, next, thanks, Richard. So this is um, what the website looks like um, if you were to go in there um, at the moment. So the top left, you've got um, historical um, forecasts and projections. Um, and um, so we're on the forecast at the moment. So historical, as I mentioned, is, is really part of um, uh, a service that's been existing for a while. But both the forecast and projections are something new. So the projections provide you with um, uh, climate change scenarios and emission scenarios out for a number of decades um, as well. So you can look into that if that's of interest. But for this particular seasonal uh, forecast, you can choose the month and the year um, that of interest uh, the timeline. But you'll see that then choose a particular either soil moisture runoff or, or ET that you're interested in. Um, you can um, along the top there you've got you can select by see so you can select by catchment um, by particular um, uh, river region that you're interested in, or by state or nationally uh, to look at the data which is on the right hand side you'll see box plots as well so you can you can you can aggregate that data and and information in relation to each um, part of those websites um, that that'll guide you and then there's also emails then to to that you can ask any more detailed questions um, of our team thanks Richard um, just to give you an idea of some of the use cases um, that we've discovered. So agriculture is, is an obvious one, particularly uh, for soil moisture. Um, uh, I, one thing to note is that, you know, these soil moisture forecasts are on a five by five K grid. So, um, you know, an individual farmer trying to, uh, you know, to see whether a particular paddock is going to be wet or dry in the next three months is, might be a bit, um, bit challenging, but it'll certainly give you an idea of what, you know, in broader terms, what you're likely to expect. Um, across the landscape. Emergency services um, have expressed a real interest. Um, so for flood risk monitoring, uh, particularly in those areas where if soil moisture and, and runoff is expected to be high, the stream, the stream flow forecasts are high, then... Um... There's probably enough from me because we have a lot of questions. Of course, the early bird questions get right of way. So I'm going to do those first. So firstly, Jennifer Watson, using stream flow data to establish limits. Can you see that, Paul? Because it's under my... Yeah, I've, it's under my thing as well. <laughs> yeah, inter, so using stream flow data to establish limits for inflows into receiving water body. Uh, so 
I'm not sure exactly. It's, so I, I, I probably could talk a bit more generally. So we certainly see our, our inflow and we call them inflow forecasts um, into storages as really the high value part of the seasonal, well, both the seven day and seasonal, but particularly the seasonal um, service. And it's interesting that, so we work with, um, a number of uh, the water managers or storage managers, and they provide us with estimates of inflows into these catchments, into these storages. And so we don't actually calculate those inflows um, ourselves, but they do. So they will use stream flow um, uh, measurements as well as um, uh, any other, you know, water balance or that they might scale and, and use all sorts of techniques. Um, but we rely on individual uh, storage managers to provide us with a series of um, inflows. And so really for the seasonal, because it's a, it's a probabilistic model, as I said, all we, well, to, to, to set up the model, um, the, the, the most important bit of information we need is a, is a time series of any sorts of flows. So they can be from a cage, which is the majority of our locations, but they can also be a series of inflows into a storage um, which is which is calculated by the storage managers using uh, gauges and and water, and water balance methods. So um, but yeah, that that's something, and that's something where that's really where we're expanding. We're talking to a lot of um, a number of people, um, water managers, uh, to um, uh, yeah to to increase the number of uh, forecasts that we we provide story uh, forecasts for. But in terms of of limits, I guess so. What we've found as well is that um, water managers tend to be, or certainly those that manage water tend to be rather conservative. So um, with DPE, for example, um, in that example that I gave, uh, they would still use the, the, the no flow scenario as their, their you know, bottom limit, I guess. Um, and in terms of uh, providing water allocations, so they wouldn't use our forecasts for that, but they do provide our forecasts. They have provided them to their customers for additional information. Yeah, in terms of uh, you know developing their allocations. Uh, look, they they're probably in very porous, and it's gone off this. But look, yeah, they probably would. Again, it would depend on the catchment. How much of the base flow is part of that? Uh, how much base flow contributes to stream flow? Um, one of the things uh, we certainly with, um, so in terms of the, the seasonal, um, uh, uh, the seasonal uh, service, the, the model doesn't implicitly um, or explicitly use groundwater yeah, informational base flow. So we gather that really, that's where um, the beauty of using um, stream flow comes in is that that really captures a lot of things and it, uh, you know, among other things it captures the groundwater component of that catchment it really is a, an indicator of how wet that catchment is and um, you know the research that was done shows that that, that persistence um, really helps you know it is the biggest source of, of skill or performance in most of our forecasts and that you know, particularly in the southeast mainland um, so, um, so yeah, I bet they would, but again, you know, with providing a service, we have to be able to update, you know, relatively quickly and routinely. So the, uh, the best, you know, in, in improving performance is not the only metric we use. So that we need to have an efficient service as well that, and, our, and systems that can cope with providing that service and, and be reliable as well so but yeah i bet i bet in some cases yeah groundwater you know measurements could be could be very helpful hmm Not at, not at this stage. I think, um, look, I know, so we, we do have uh, groundwater. Uh, so the Bureau does deal, you know, in groundwater as well. Um, but I think one of the issues um, uh, is probably just being able to incorporate, I don't, my understanding is that our, we ingest groundwater data on a, 
probably on a weekly or monthly basis. I think I don't think it's regular enough. Um, the model, the sorry, the bureau is also embarking on sort of a a much larger project. That I, I mentioned we use Aura to run our Australian Water Outlook. We're doing work um, looking the, the the future plans and the next five or ten years is to use a model that's used in the UK known as Jules. So that's undergoing research um, at the bureau as well. So I suspect that one will have um, a better groundwater component to it um, and so any improvements or any incorporation will you know into, into other parts of the water balance will come through that you know the sort of adoption of that of that model I guess. Right we better get on to the next few questions. Um, rainfall forecasts beyond one season. <laughs> Everyone uh, always wants to know that. Uh, well, it's, look, it's always a challenge. Um, I think I think experimentally the Bureau does provide, look, you know, internally we have forecasts, I think, out to nine months or something, but I don't, I really don't think there's any skill or any performance in those. Um, and so, so that's a challenge, I guess. Um, what we, we do have experimentally also with the seasonal um, uh, streamflow forecasts, that I mentioned, the catchment-based ones. We actually have uh, an experimental product where we provide an outlook at 12 months for flows. Um, and uh, we actually do get some skill still out to 12 months, and that's because of that persistence. So particularly, um, you know, for places in the Southeast, uh, on the Southeast mainland, um, if we, we would have forecast now, for example, in the, you know, the higher um, flow part of the year, uh, then that skill out to a year, we can you know have skill out to a year, but it comes from that persistence, which you just don't have in rainfall because it's pretty much chaotic for the best part. So, so the landscape forecasts are always going to struggle, I think. Um, and also we find, so soil moisture is, is I think, has the best skill um, of, the, of the hydrological variables. Runoff, not so good um, because... Of course, any, any uncertainty and variability we have in rainfall, which is the biggest limit to providing um, you know, skillful water forecasts, is, is, is the rainfall. Being a, if we could do much better in rainfall. So, you know, if we look over the past, if we, we um, put in observed rainfall into our models, we can, we can provide much better, you know, we do really well in terms of soil moisture and runoff. But it's the forecast. So it's the forecast rainfall that we fed into the model where the uncertainty is. And that uncertainty tends to get amplified when you come to the end of the, the water balance because most of the water, you know, evaporation and what's left over, soil moisture, and then runoff. So very small changes and that variability in rainfall gets amplified in the runoff. So runoff is a really big change and, and you need to you cater for the, you know, the landscape and the way that water moves through the, the landscape, which is a real challenge. So that's, that's going to be the biggest challenge, I think. So, Paul, do you see um, farmers using more the planned available water estimates or soil moisture now than rainfall? For their yeah, I think they will. I think they will. Um, again, it's it's a relatively early. I mean, I'm not involved in that um, part of the the service directly, but yeah, that's certainly um, uh, that's certainly where the main interest I think from developing that water forecasting capability came from was from the agricultural sector in relation to soil moisture. Maybe just a point um, uh, with some of the work we've seen with DPI in New South Wales, they've got coupled pasture growth models to these uh, sort of planned available water estimates that we're seeing. So it's quite amazing, but you know there are projections of pasture growth rates that can go out you know, effectively 40 years for, for given areas because we now have these projections of land available water using models like what Paul's been talking about, which I find amazing, to be honest. Um, apologies to a few people because we've had a couple of technical issues today. So some of the Q&A questions have dropped off. I guess it's a bit of a learning. You want to be in the early bird batch. But I do have um, a few that must have been put in later. So I will read those. Um, 
So I have one from Jennifer Watson. I'm interested in stream flow data for a specific creek catchment area. How do I find out if data is available either via a public user or registered user yeah. to the database? So that's historical data, I'm presuming. So the first place to look at will be on the Bureau's website. We do have a national um, database of, of stream flow information um, and it's called Water Data Online. So if you go to, you know, probably do a Google search on Water Data Online and, that, and Bureau, um, that will take you to that particular website where there's a national database. Or, or, and, or, or at failing that, I suspect if it's not there, it might not be, but you could also look on a state, the state agencies um, have their own databases as well. Okay, a question from Anthony Marzalek. Can we access daily runoff estimates for all 99 ensembles for use in our own water balance, water supply models? So, no, look, that's, that's the other thing I didn't mention. So I think that's going to be a challenge. So we don't provide daily. Um, it's something you'd have to ask. I wouldn't know if there was daily information, it's certainly not public. Uh, I don't know if it would be technically available either. Um, uh, so the, we had uh, as a separate project, and something that might come down the pipeline as well as part of the Australian Water Outlook was that we have been looking at, um, uh, in addition to the, the seasonal forecast, we had been looking at providing forecasts for, uh, for zero to nine days using the same model. So technically it is possible, um, but we, we haven't, we haven't, you know, got there yet. Um, so that is, that is on the cards, that, that is something the Bureau is seriously looking into. And then I would have thought, yes, then in that case, I would have said yes, but I'm not quite sure with the current seasonal service, whether that's possible, but I, I suspect have a look at the website and follow up, um, uh, contact the Bureau through the website to ask that question. Okay, so Jason Pan has asked for the new technology to do the water forecasts and monitoring. Does UAVs and USV have an involvement in it? Uh, so I think he's looking at that. Is there an application for that technology to help you to improve it? Um. Probably not at this stage. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that, uh, you know, we provide national services, so we need to have, um, you know, uh, frameworks and, and to set up to, um, to ingest national data. That's one of the issues we had with the soil moisture um, as well. You know, how do you, you calibrate and parameterize a national model um, where you, you, know, you don't really have, um, um, you know, good soil data. Um, the only you know, isolated, if you look at the, the country, have been isolated areas where you have, um, you know, really good soil moisture data, for example, to test the model against. So that's one of the challenges we have that we have to make some assumptions as well. But we also have to. Um, Again, it's, it's, it's a real balance of, of trying to improve the model and provide the best performance, but how can we do that operationally? So um, it's not just about providing the best forecast, um, but you know, providing it in a way that is valuable to users and in, you know, in a way that they can access and understand and at a, at a time step that's, that makes sense as well. So it's a challenge, but we're always looking into better ways. Um, and as I said, that new modeling framework that we're looking into will, will also um, get us to ask those sorts of questions again, how can we better? So we do have data assimilation and, and, and we do have teams that look into that, those areas. All right, well, we've, we're just about, well, we are out of time. Paul, you've given us an extra six minutes for free, which is very kind of you. <laughs> Pleasure. But been there so are nice, Richard, that so. have been put into the Q&A, so uh, actually into the chat. So I'm going to have a quick go with those. Um, Paul Webb, have to go. Very interesting and informative. I will be watching the projections evolution to support natural resource management, yep. stakeholder awareness, 
locally in South Queensland, the Climate Mates are doing great work making Bureau of Met product info and explanations available for land managers. So that's a good response. I do think this is something that um, is an area to look at how to collaborate is um, just readiness to find what one may want out of the Bureau. You know, that sort of interface between maybe the application of it versus what's obviously fantastic resources inside. Uh, I think there's a bit of a theme that's come out of a couple of questions there so, and comments. Um, irrigators use plant available water capacity plus RF plus stream flow forecasts and outlooks. So I guess R is rain, RF is rain rainfall. Yeah. Plus yeah, look, I, that's a good point too. That a lot of it, and that's I think something the bureau. So, uh, for, the bureau's undergone a big transformation the last two years, and we're still undergoing that transformation. I think one of the, 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 the yeah, one of the important parts of that as well is to to bring together um, a lot of our services to understand how customers use different parts of the bureau. I think in in the past, um, the services developed sort of into large yeah independently to a large degree um, so there will be changes in the coming years to the bureau's um, web interface to better reflect that sort of how you know how users um, engage with the bureau and how they use different services so to, to improve that that experience as well so it's, it's a good point thanks for raising that oh, it's always good to have a bit of a dig pull um oh always yeah <laughs> Um, I think that concludes all the questions. Um, so I'd just like to say thanks very much, Paul. Um, that, that has been excellent. And uh, I really do think um, you guys are doing a fantastic job. I think the sort of nirvana of, you know, maximising utility of this data is going to be some degree facilitated through these sort of software providers who integrate the Bureau's data into their services. And I think yep. sort of maximising that interface um, is probably key to getting to market. Yes, it is. But, um, yeah. Thanks for that. That's important, Richard, because we can only do so much. So we, we will draw the line, I guess. And there's an expectation that, yeah, that people will, will make use and add a lot of value to our what, what we produce and the data we produce. It is. I mean, it's... Um, People look at all these different forecasting services, right? And they don't realise that sitting behind it 99.9% .9 of the time is the, the Bureau's data. Yeah. They're going through some other yep. set of algorithms yep. that yep. may or may not be, be most appropriate. So um, anyway, look, Paul, great to catch up. And many thanks for everyone who have uh, been involved in today. It's been a great audience. And many thanks for all those questions. Uh, it's been really good to reconnect, Paul, and um, has. Let's catch up again soon. All right, Indeed. thanks very thanks, much, Richard. everybody. Thanks for having me. That's a pleasure. See you. Bye-bye.